What's going on, Mount Hope Church? Thank you so much for joining us in the after party. We are so pumped. I'm here with Jordan Townsend and Sarah Kessler. And uh, today is Pentecost Sunday. We are excited. We had an incredible service. Pastor Kevin did a great job. And we're here. Jordan, what was your favorite part of the sermon today? Yeah, um, I loved Pastor Kevin was talking about how fear is constantly trying to occupy space in your life. And just that idea that, you know, fear is trying to occupy the space that the spirit is meant to occupy. You know, and there's like this consistent battle in your life between which you're going to offer that space too. And I was just reminded how important it is in your life to offer that space continually, to welcome the Holy Spirit, to invite him in and say, fear, I'm telling you no. And like, Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you into that place. Yeah, that's so good, Sarah. What would you say? I loved when he was talking about a new normal. And he said this a few times now. I want to read it so I don't mess it up. Um, He said, when the world goes back to normal, don't go with them. Mm. And during worship this morning, before he even spoke, um, I was just started, it was just kind of in more of a spontaneous moment I just started singing out um, and was just singing like God you are doing a new thing you're doing a new thing you're doing a new thing and so I believe there is a new normal but I don't think it's the way that the world is thinking the new normal will look but God is doing a new thing Um, and we even he Pastor Kevin you know then began to speak on that so that was pretty cool yeah what does the new normal look like uh, for the world we'll talk about what it looks like for us but what does that look like for the world what do you think they're going to go back to what do you think the world's going to go back to Jordan yeah I think well it was kind of like the fear and spirit contrast that I was just talking about I think that for the rest of the world there's going to be really an onset of fear as their new normal. You know what I mean? Now it's like, well, what motivates me every day? My fear of this, my fear of X, Y, Z, you know, and the devil's so clever because it's not illegitimate fear sometimes, you know what I mean? Well, fear for your existence, fear for your health, fear for your safety, but, you know, we're called as a, as a community to have faith, you know, over mm-hmm. fear, but I think that the thing that we'll have to recognize in the way that we'll have to address the world is understanding that fear has become the main motivator in their life after this. Yeah, man, that's so good because that that's the part that really spoke up to me that was my favorite part is just even the scripture that he read the very beginning of that where the apostles are behind the doors, locked doors, by the way, and they're fearful because that's what fear does. It locks you in. And then Jesus shows up in the middle and he's of it and he says, peace be still because the antidote or the answer to fear isn't courage. Yeah. It's peace. And yeah. so like that to me, it speaks so clearly, but I definitely think that it's going to be an absence of peace and a, a, an upswing of fear that's going to be the new normal for the world. What would you say is the new normal? For yeah, I think, um, I think there's going to be a bigger, um, I think it's going to be a more obvious, like, like Pastor Kevin touched on this, like the light versus the darkness. I think it's going to become more and more obvious um, who's carrying the light of God and who is just full of that fear or darkness, you know, who hasn't tapped into that light yet, but maybe will soon, hopefully will soon. Um, And I think as believers, like we need to be so aware of that and not, um, there's already been this kind of like, well, fear versus faith. And it's like, well, I'm going to hug you anyway, because I'm full of faith. And it's like being not just respectful, but being loving enough to other believers and non-believers alike to just be respectful of where they are and love them enough to not be like, well, I have faith and you don't because you're wearing a mask. Like that is so lame. And so we need to just be loving enough to not look at how somebody else might be handling a situation and judge them immediately for that. So I think there's going to be a bigger difference, light and darkness, but also... um, I think believers are going to need to choose love more than ever before. Yeah, yeah. Speak to that a little bit more. Like, what's the new normal for the church then? What do you see? Um... Okay, somebody else share because I just shared. Like that's what those are my thoughts. Yeah, I think so. The new normal for the church. Well, I think there's a real responsibility, you know, to tap into that Holy Spirit indwelling in ourselves, you know, Um, because the greatest way to combat fear is not to encourage yourself. Like I I put courage in myself. I'm strengthening myself. Like I'm just going to be strong. It's inviting the Holy Spirit, you know, because it's a natural fruit of his presence is peace. You know, so I think we have a responsibility to really engage with the promise of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think it's important in our lives to rank the two most important gifts that Jesus gave us. The first is salvation by far, bar none. And the second is the Holy Spirit, that exchange that happened when he left the earth and he sent the Holy Spirit in his place. So I think that for the church, the new normal looks like engaging with that promise and daily inviting the indwelling of the Spirit. Because two things are going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is peace is going to be overwhelming in your life because the Holy Spirit can't be present without bringing peace along with him. It's a fruit and fruit always grows on the tree that it's meant to grow on and peace grows with him. Um, The second thing that's going to happen is we're going to live an empowered existence. So every time we walk into a situation 
situation that needs breakthrough, we will bring it naturally because when the spirit's with you, you walk in breakthrough power and that spills over to other people. So I think that's what we're responsible to do in this season. That's what our new normal looks like is walking hand in hand with the Holy Spirit and seeing breakthrough for people who are broken. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the, the thought Pastor Kevin gave where he said uh, supernatural gatherings happen or supernatural happenings happen as a result of the gathering. And uh, I, I think that's our new normal. Our new normal is we're not just reading about supernatural things that happen in scripture. We're seeing supernatural things happen among us. And I'm not talking about just physical manifestations. I'm talking about mental, right? Because that's a lot of our world today where people carry a lot of baggage and a lot of bondage and they don't know how to get free from those things. I think yeah. that is something in our new normal that we're about to walk into. What would you say? Yeah, I think that the, again, going to like the light and darkness analogy, I think as God's kids were set up better than ever before to just those little light moments is the phrase I keep thinking of, like, like a little light, like a little match, like, like how my dad was talking about, um, at, at QD, he was just saw a man and was just filled with compassion and just wanted to like do something like, Holy Spirit, how can I just like show an ounce of the, the huge ocean of love that you have for him, you know, and maybe it's just a smile, maybe because right now more than ever, People are longing, like we're created for relationship. We're created for closeness with God and with each other. Yeah. So now more than ever before, people are just aching for relationship, yep. aching for a smile, aching for eye contact, right. you know? And so I feel like we're just set up better than ever before to just so easily share just the kindness of Jesus with other people. And they're going to be like, whoa, like that's different than everybody else is all like, don't cough on me. Don't, don't look at me. Don't, you know what I mean? And we're just like, Hey, like yeah. I see you, like, how are you? You know? Yeah, no, that, that's super helpful. And I think in QD, there's only one peace offering. It's a donut. If somebody oh, wants to God. Me over, Show me. chocolate donut, I would have been and good. a little death by <laughs> chocolate. Can I get an amen? Crazy thrice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But let me ask this last question. Jordan, what do you think the church should be doing? Yeah. Right? Because PK preached this passionate, inspirational, encouraging, challenging message today. And it's like, wow, we heard all of that. What are we supposed to be doing right now? Yeah, I think that it's important to look at things, you know, Sarah, kind of like you were just touching on in a really practical lens and a spiritual lens, you know, um, I think it's easy to really, to really gravitate towards one side, be like, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and I just like, I smile at people every day and that's the extent, or like, I'm a Christian. So I go up to you and I put my hand on your forehead and I say, Shondai until, you know, <laughs> until you go out in the spirit and QD, you know, and, and both, I mean, it's beautiful intention on either end, but faith is a marriage of those two things. Yeah. You know, it's understanding, it's having discernment and hearing from the Holy Spirit to know what that moment needs. Yeah. Like Pastor Kevin was talking about earlier in today's message. So on a really practical end, I think it's important for us to recognize, like us as Mount Hope, how to reach people. Um, on the practical end, joy is like the billboard for satisfaction in your faith. You know what I'm saying? Um, like the reason that God puts such an emphasis on joy is because when people see you with joy, they want desperately whatever it is that you have. Mm-hmm. You know, so people in the world will put forth fake joy and then people gravitate towards whatever is their foundation. But for us, we have real joy, authentic joy. And I think it's important to put that on display. You know what I mean? Just to show like, okay, like even a smile is powerful for people because they're like, why are you satisfied? Why are you happy? So putting joy on display shows people I'm rooted in something that you want to be a part of. That's on the practical side of things, you know. That's why even though people who are ranting on Facebook, they might not even be wrong, but I'm not going to do it because I'm going to put joy on display. You know what I'm saying? Like being a hyper realist isn't always helpful, you know. And then on on the spiritual side of things, I think you know, what we do, especially looking at Pentecost Sunday, uh, engage in bold acts of faith. You know, like there's moments where people need your smile and they need just a simple word of encouragement. And there's moments where people need breakthrough prayer. There's moments where the person who's checking you out at the store needs you to pray for their healing. Or they, you're going to get a prophetic word and you need to speak it out over them about where they're going in their life. So engaging with those things and on the practical side of things, being an encourager, being a light wherever you go, and then also being willing to engage in a bold way and see God do amazing things in the marketplace in your everyday life. I think those things are huge. Yeah, that's awesome. Sarah, what would you say? So what does the church need to do right now? Um, I'm going to switch things up a little bit (laughs) and reframe the question. I think um, I'm going to answer your question with a question. (laughs) A little bit like Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. I think it's um, about what does the church need to be right now? Mm Because when I look at Jesus, I'm like, okay, who was he? Like God is love. Like he is the Prince of Peace. So So when I think of like that is who he is. He doesn't walk around like or, you know, 
pacing in heaven. <laughs> like, what do I need to do to like help my children? Like, he's like, oh, I'm going to be their provider. That's who I am for them. Wow. I'm going to be love that casts out the fear that they're facing. And so if we're his kids, like we follow in those footsteps, like who do I need to be? And it is in those spiritual alone moments with the Lord where the Holy Spirit is like, hey, today, like this is what you have it all in you because he is in us. And so when you run into the people at QD or, or you bump into your neighbor and they're coming outside for the first time or whatever, it's like, okay, who do you need to be to them? Yeah. Holy Spirit, because that's in me, so that's who I'm going to be to them. And it might be something small and practical, like a smile or like a hello or like, how are you doing, you know, and genuinely meaning it and staying and listening for their actual answer. You know what I mean? Right. Um, or it might be something more spiritual. If it is your brother and sister in Christ, it might look a little bit different, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, th I think that's really good. And, and what you said reminds me of the, the, the passage that says Jesus became sin, became, became, so that we might become, right? Like, I love that. That's super helpful. I think something that the church should be doing today is really what Pastor Kevin started his message talking about, and that's addressing what's currently happening in the world, yeah. right? The Jews were, uh, they were behind locked doors for they were afraid of the Jews. And he said, this reminds me a lot to, of today, Pastor Kevin. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes, jump in. So I think, um, you know, today, obviously, we're all three of us, we're aware of the fact uh, that racial tension is high in our nation today. Yeah. And uh, it, it's something that people either are wildly outspoken about because they want everyone to know how they feel or they're afraid to speak up because they don't know what to say. Yeah. And, uh, man, I just want to ask, what are your thoughts on, on this today? What are, what are your thoughts well, on Peter, this? Well, Peter, I was thinking of, uh, one, I think it's important that we recognize what's happened in the world and more than just recognize, like, I love your last question. What are we supposed to do now? What do we do with that? And even before we, we dig into that together, um, you and I had a conversation uh, just a little while ago. And I forget where, driving, driving the car somewhere. But you told me that when you were a young boy, your father told you something. Yeah. And tell us what that, because when you told me that, that helped me connect with, how you grew up yep. and how you grew up thinking. Tell me about that. Yeah, so he told me, he said, listen, the, the police, when they stop you, they, they want to hurt you. Like they, they want to make sure that you're, uh, they want to keep you in line and they want to do it forcefully. They want to put their hands on you. Don't give them a reason to find something wrong uh, because they, they want to hurt you. And so I grew up understanding like not with a healthy fear of police officers, but a real fear like, hey, like if I even uh, approach this in any wrong way, like that could be my life. And so when they stop you, you know, he told me to call them mm -hmm. sir and ma'am. He told me to put my hands on the steering wheel. He told me when they ask for license and registration, don't just reach over, ask them what I heard you say is you want me to grab my license and my registration. Now I'm about to grab my license and registration. And so I grew up with all these different rules in mm. our context culture of what it was like when you got stopped by a police officer until one day I was in the car with one of my white friends on the way to get some Taco Bell. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, he literally, a police officer stopped us because a taillight was out on his car and the police officer came to the window and he said, you got to tell me why you pulled me over. And I was like, uh, my man, like you can't <laughs> You can't do that. And he was like, you, you had no right to pull me over. And he was aggressive with the officer. And I was like, we're going to jail. Like, this is, you know, and the officer was just like, hey, I apologized to him, told him why I pulled over and walked away. And I was like, oh, there's a difference. So there's a difference. That's, that's a huge difference. Like, I can't even fathom, like, this, this is what, it, this must be white right. privilege right here, right? I'm right. privileged in that. I didn't grow up ever thinking they want to hurt me. Right. 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 So when I got stopped, I just thought, oh, man, I didn't go, oh, no. Right. 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 So I'm curious, Peter, what was it like for you growing up having a fear yeah. they want to hurt me? Right. But beyond that, what was it like when you saw it being different when it was a, a white friend who wasn't? Yeah. What, did, what did that do? Yeah. Well, the, the first part of it is this, is that it's kind of it's unfair because not all police officers are like that. Yes. Like we have men and women, you know, in our church and in our family that are that are law enforcement that carry the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yep. So I don't mean to group everyone and make a, a large good. generalization. But what I grew up thinking, you know, is is man. I have to be on high alert at all times. And it's so interesting with this dichotomy where you like, where like if someone broke into my home, I would have to call the police. But then I wondered, 
Well, if they came into my home, would they? Would something happen where they're like, well, actually, we found this in your home. And, and I didn't have anything to hide. It's just these fears that you build. Because mm -hmm. fear builds on fear. You know yeah. what I mean? And so it's this weird thing where you know you need to trust them because the community says they're good. But you also hear from outside perspective or inside perspective, my parents are like, hey, you need to be careful, you know? Yeah. So it was really just confusing, if I'm being honest with you. And now as I'm kind of watching a lot of the things that are happening uh, in our nation, um, you know, it, it's, we're in a difficult position because, again, when one person does something wrong, everyone gets generalized. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I just, my hope is this, is that we would, we would be able to empathize with one another, to see one another for, where, for who we really are, where we really are, and uh, that we would move forward together. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just so hard, so difficult, you know? And as a, as a Christian man, too, like I said it, you know, today as the end of service, like I, I had to come to the reality and the fact that, like, I'm a Christian first before I'm black, before I'm a man, before I'm anything. I'm a Christian first. Yep. And that means that I answer to Jesus. Yep. That means I got to see Jesus uh, in, in every situation and I got to see people the way Jesus sees them. Yep. And so in, in, a, in a time where, if I'm just being honest, I'm frustrated. Uh, again, several situations of just like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's easy uh, or I'm sorry, it's hard to lean on the fact that I'm a Christian first, you know? Yeah. So. I, think it's, I think it's so important that we, we talk about what can be done. Yeah. Because if you feel like all you can do is put a post on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, like there's something more we can do. Yeah. Like, and I want to get into what can we do? Because I think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. Yeah. And he was upset because the white Christians, they thought that slavery was evil, but they were mad at him because he, would, he was demonstrating. His point was, hey, listen, like, I don't really get why you're mad that I'm demonstrating. If you knew me, you would be mad about the injustice yes. that was being done, yes. right? So he was upset about the inactivity of other people who didn't get the injustice. They didn't they weren't willing to rock the boat or do anything. So to both of you, to both of you, Jordan and Peter, like what can what do you think we could people all of us can do in this moment to show empathy and actually put action to prayers and love? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that it's important. And like when I say like I think white people should do this, like I don't mean I almost don't like saying that because it, it makes it feel like there's like two groups pitted against each other, you know. And I think for the majority of us, like we really love each other. Like this this church is super like mixed with all races and it's awesome and beautiful. But you know, like I think there is some responsibility race to race because like you know there's obviously injustices from white people towards black. And so anyway, uh, as like a precursor, I wanted to say that. But um, I think that you know it, it reminds me of when I was a kid and like I would come home crying and. Like, my dad would just hug me. Like, he didn't, he didn't be like, okay, wait a minute. Are you crying for justified reason? Like, wait, okay, let me tell you. You know, like, he would just hug me. And so I think it's important to remember that, like, when people are hurt, it's not your time to correct, even if you think it is. You know what I mean? Like, there's, you know, and for whatever reason, I feel like there's a community of people who feel like it's their time to, like, inform you on why you should or shouldn't be hurt. Hmm. And it's like, you know, when people are hurting, like, you, the only responsibility you have is to hug them, love them and empathize with them, yeah. you know? And I think, I mean, you and I have talked about this extensively, like that's what's being asked for, like, which is an extremely reasonable request anytime you're hurting, you know what I mean? So for people who are like, well, this is my time to get my opinion out. Okay, it's actually not, you know what I mean? It's, it's time to just love. It's time to just be affectionate and take yeah. care and like love a brother, love a sister. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think what can be done is, man, and I appreciate the, the campaigns and the rallies on Facebook and, and not the riots. Right. I, let me differentiate. Not the riots, the rallies of like, hey, what can we do? How can we help? Um, I think that when people, uh, like when people are posting, if that is the extent of your involvement in this situation, you're not involved. It takes really nothing for you to post whatsoever. And so when people ask me, they're like, did you not see my post? I'm like... I don't care about your post. I have people who actually love me who when something like this happens, they call, how are you doing? I think the real thing that we can do is take care of the people within our span of influence yeah. that are affected by these situations. And so it's picking up the phone and saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How do you feel? Tell me about your frustrations. Yeah. It's empathizing with them and understanding that, yes, I can make a post and publicly declare, hey, I'm here to help, but also that's not the extent of it. And uh, man, as, as someone who, again, is in ministry, I'm thinking, 
thinking about the people in our church. Like, I can make a statement because I want to reach everyone at once. That takes no effort. I've got to speak and call and ask. And, you know, it's just, man, it's a tough place for us to be in um, as as a people, especially our house. Like Jordan said, we love each other. And we don't see that. We don't feel that tension within our building. Um, But but when we step outside and we look around, we see people hurting. Our job is to be an ear to them, not a voice to them, right? Like, we don't, people don't need your solutions. They need your sympathy, right? Like, they need you to dig in and say, hey, I'm here. I'm available. And for me, what what I would prefer in this situation, because in both cases, in the Ahmaud Arbery case and the George Floyd case, this isn't like, um, like, I couldn't picture myself in it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like I could picture myself, especially with the Ahmad Arbery. Oh. Like, I when I saw his picture, I was like, he looks a lot like me, you know. And so I could, I could imagine myself in that scenario, and uh, you know, and even, even the, even just the people who called me and said, "Hey, this stinks." Yeah, that was more helpful than, "Hey, you know why you shouldn't be upset?" You know, oh, like, or you know, on. the kingdom of heaven. I'm like, "Hey, calm down." <laughs> like, we're gonna work this out. But I think empathy and uh, really taking care of the people in your span of your care is the answer to this moment. It really comes down to relationships, doesn't it? So, yes. like, I've been texting with a few friends. Yes. How are you doing? And I even think about that with, with MLK's letter from the jail. Like, what I was thinking this, like, what if these, these white Christians who, who didn't get why he was doing what he was doing, they didn't care about the injustice. I thought, man, what if they were breaking bread together? Mm. What if they were hanging out together? Yep. What if, of course, they didn't post in those days. But what if they actually took the time to sit down and how are you? What's going on in your world? Well, my sister just got beaten. Well, this just got, oh, wait a minute. Right. There would naturally be, I think, yeah. empathy. How are you? How can I? I can't believe that. Exactly. And I think one last thought is this, is like we're called to see color. It's actually beautiful. I like right? Like it's that, yeah. so beautiful. We're called to see it. And are you black? That, right, exactly. Yes. And, and we're saying, yellow. Yeah. <laughs> I did say I feel like a butterfinger finger right now, but uh, <laughs> we're supposed to acknowledge one another, see and acknowledge it. It's a powerful thing. And some people might say that's uncomfortable. And I'm like, yes, yeah. yes, it is. Of course it's uncomfortable because you have to step out the, outside the bounds of what you feel comfortable doing out of your comfort zone and say, you know what, this is who I'm called to be. And as a Christian, we all know we're all made in the image of God. Yep. We celebrate that above everything else. And if you can't acknowledge yep. what color someone is and celebrate it, there's no way you can acknowledge the image of God that they are created in. That's good, Peter. Yeah. So hey, just to wrap up our conversation, I would encourage every one of us today, go find somebody. You know, take take some depth in relationships, something beyond the post. Go actually call somebody, text somebody, hang out with somebody, and express kindness, love, and empathy as you carry God's presence with you this week, all week long. God bless you, and thanks for hanging out.